Welcome to the Grand Theft World podcast, hosted and sponsored by GrandTheftWorld.com. This is episode 111. It's December 18th, 2022. We're almost into 2023. This was like the biggest week in news. There's so much crazy wild news going on this week. We're going to be here for the next six or seven hours, smashing that news, juxtaposing it with uh, the documents. We'll talk about some of these documents tonight and the evidence, the artifacts, the things that help you understand so you can come to cogent decisions, concise judgments and actions in your life with respect to the news. It's pretty hard to just watch the news. It's all fragmented all week. What are you supposed to make of all that? Do you have time to process it all? Did you have time to look up the references? Did you have time to look at opposing views? That's why you have this show. You break it down on Sunday night. You guys can listen to the replay all week. It's better. It's healthier to listen to something that's not so fragmented and maybe more organized. That organized information, it provides utility. Introducing Ectolife, the world's first artificial womb facility, powered entirely by renewable energy. Ectolife allows infertile couple to conceive a baby and become the true biological parents of their own offspring. It's a perfect solution for women who had their uterus surgically removed due to cancer or other complications. With Ectolife, premature births and C-sections will be a thing of the past. Ectolife is designed to help countries that are suffering from severe population decline, including Japan, Bulgaria, South Korea, and many others. The facility features 75 highly equipped labs. Each state-of-the-art lab can accommodate up to 400 growth pods or artificial wombs. Every pod is designed to replicate the exact conditions that exist inside the mother's uterus. A single building can incubate up to 30,000 lab-grown babies per year. Ectolife allows your baby to develop in an infection-free environment. The pods are made of materials that prevent germs from sticking to their surfaces. Every growth pod features sensors that can monitor your baby's vital signs, including heartbeat, temperature, blood pressure, breathing rate, and oxygen saturation. The artificial intelligence-based system also monitors the physical features of your baby and reports any potential genetic abnormalities. The pods are equipped with a screen that displays real-time data on the developmental progress of your baby. These data are sent directly to your phone so you can track your baby's health from the comfort of your zone. The app also provides you with a high-resolution live view of your baby's development. A special section in the app allows you to watch a time-lapse of your baby's growth and share it directly with your loved ones. Because babies can recognize language and learn new words while still in the womb, Ectolife growth pods feature internal speakers that play a wide range of words and music to your baby. Through the app, you can choose the playlist that your baby listens to. You can also directly sing to your baby and make them familiar with your voice before birth. Our goal is to provide you with an intelligent offspring that truly reflects your smart choices. Ectolife improves your bonding experience with your baby thanks to a 360 degrees camera that's fitted inside your baby's growth pod you can use your virtual reality headset to explore what it's like to be in your baby's place see what they see and hear what they hear using a wireless haptic suit connected to your baby's growth pod you will be able to sense their kicks in the womb and share this experience with your friends and family members This week in Grand Theft World, we had, I'm sorry to say that we had what they called a, a bloody massacre, a major bloodbath. The Washington Post has to lay off some people. And I guess that fake news isn't as profitable as it used to be, or at least people aren't willing to pay attention to it. And that was described in the press. We'll see, we hear from Breaking Point, Sagar and Jetty as a major bloodbath. <laughs> Major bloodbath in the media environment right now. Washington Post announcing layoffs did not go over well with the staff. Let's take a listen. 
You know, it's really odd, Crystal. Like, I, I'm no fan of the Washington Post and the journals, but like, I got to feel for them in this situation. Like, what kind of boss just comes in and is like, just so you guys know, we're going to have layoffs next year. It's like, what? Why would you announce it that way? Take no questions. Basically have everyone living in fear for like weeks, possibly right before Christmas. even months right before <laughs> yeah. Christmas. There was is it a, cruel? There was, yeah. it, it is kind of cruel. Yeah. It's also just like really, I mean, it's just really poor form. Right. It's made his own life more difficult. Yes, that, agreed. Like, why, who, who would think that it was a good idea to go to all your staff and just basically be like, yep, it's gonna be bad. All right, happy, yeah. Merry Christmas. I'll see you in the new year. Now. Another sad event that happened this week. You guys remember in history class learning about Crystal Nacht, the night of the broken glass, World War II, Nazi Germany, people burned alive. It was atrocious. Some events went on this week that were compared to Crystal Nacht. It was called the Thursday Night Massacre. Nobody was killed. A couple journalists got some Twitter suspensions. They compared that to Crystal Nacht. They called it a massacre. You can look it up on Wikipedia right now, Thursday Night Massacre. It's a thing. So we're going to talk about some of the hyperbolization and the dangers it does to historical events like Kristallnacht, which is an, it's an important event in history, and it shouldn't be belittled because when everything is Kristallnacht, nothing is Kristallnacht anymore. And I think that's a problem. Posted by Libs of TikTok, but this this is the tweet, I think. I'm guessing that... that uh... <clears throat> Probably Elon set the Light. fire. So it says, last night in a bloodbath, Twitter purged in mass mainstream journalists who cover Elon Musk. I'm reminded of Crystal Nacht. <laughs> Free speech was the second big lie. This is what bare-knuckled fascism looks like. Oh, it man. Is. That fascist label is Comparing around. what Oof. happened to those people to Crystal Nacht is bare-knuckled fascism. I agree. Back to that big story developing tonight. Twitter suspending the accounts of several journalists who cover the platform and its new owner, Elon Musk. The suspensions all happening abruptly in the last couple of hours. This seems really scary, okay? These are reporters who covered Elon Musk, who have covered the changes on Twitter since he took over. Now, he's claiming these suspensions are taking place because these reporters put him at risk, potentially posting his locations. But... There's not even evidence any of them did that. Last night, there was a wave of bans on Twitter where journalists knowingly omitted, willingly omitted the fact, the reason why they were banned, so that they could act like they were personally targeted by Elon Musk. If you've been following the Twitter hullabaloo lately, there's a lot to be said going around about tracking Elon Musk's private chat. It reached its pinnacle the other day when some lunatic... Uh, tossed themselves on the hood of the car with his child in it, uh, with Elon's son in it. And since that has happened, he has uh, run out of Fs to give. And it seemed like these journalists were more interested in trolling him. He, they, they were basically trolling him, putting his life in danger, but they didn't care about that. They knew it bothered him when they were linking to this. So they were linking to it. And that's why they got suspended. But journalists lie. And the lie that they have chosen to spread is that this information is publicly available when it is in fact not. Jack Sweeney is via Tim. Jack Sweet Tim Pool. Jim, Jim Jack Sweeney is the guy that runs the Elon's Jet account, was not posting public information. Sweeney was posting the private information of Elon Musk and he knew it. Elon has PIA, not what you think, but it's privacy address. ICAO address. Um, Elon has PIA, which seeks to protect the privacy of entities using private aircrafts. Sweeney actually bragged that he could write software to expose Elon Musk's private info. Yeah, so the PIA ICAO can be changed monthly if chosen to do so, but even then, it's relatively easy to identify. I'm confident I can write software to identify it actually. So this is not publicly available content, right? Elon Musk replies, this is correct. And 
he says here, criticizing me all day long is totally fine, but doxing my real-time location and endangering my family is not. Uh, and so what happened is a lot of journalists were, were linking to where you could still get this information. Essentially, the journalists were like linking to like Mastodon and other platforms that you could still get this information. Even Mastodon themselves, uh, again, stupid idiots, um, you know, and I, and I always support new tech. Mastodon is like a Twitter alternative. It's a little, it's a little different, a little more convoluted, but, um, you know, it has, uh, they posted a link to his jet tracker. So even Mastodon got banned and all these journalists were saying, oh my God, Elon's banning all these journalists just for journalisming wrong. And you can see he hopped into spaces with a group of journalists and informed them that the same doxing rules apply to them and they are not special. Uh, yeah. Um, well, as I'm sure everyone who's been... You can see who's in here, Elon Jet. All the people that are suspended for whatever reason could still join spaces. So Elon Jet's in here. Ben Collins, who just got suspended today, uh, like from his job as a, as a reporter. Timmy Poole's in here. Looks like Hodge Twins. Doxson uh, would agree, you know... Uh, Showing real-time uh, information about somebody's location is uh, inappropriate, and I think everyone on this call would not like that to be done to them. And, and I think so. And there is not going to be any distinction in the future between journalists, so-called journalists, and, and regular people. Everyone's going to be treated the same. Oh, 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 no. That they did not like to hear, did they? You are no better than the average Joe journalist. You will follow the same rules that they follow. You're not special because you're a journalist. You're, you're, you're just, you're, you're a Twitter, you're, just, you're a citizen. Um, so, uh, no special treatment. Um, you dox, you dox, you get suspended. End of story. Um, so, and, 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 and ban evasion, ban evasion, or like, or, or trying to be clever about it. Like, oh, I posted a link to the real-time information. It's obviously, uh, that is obviously simply trying to evade the, the, the meaning. That is there's no different from than, pace, than actually showing real-time information. Also, the Twitter files. You guys, when we last left off on Sunday night, uh, there were Twitter files showing that uh, Vijay Jagati, she had uh, limited Donald Trump's account and reach and these sort of things. We also knew about Yoel Roth doing likewise. Well, Twitter's chief safety sexpert, Yoel Roth, uh, got his uh, his comeuppance this week with Crowder and Tim Cass, a whole bunch of different reporting on the other activities that were going on with the uh, the chief Twitter meister over there, deciding who got censored around the election and what types of things got protected on on Twitter, like a bunch of uh, child molestation, child abuse, abuse of child behavior was being protected. So we're going to look into those stories tonight because as dark as it is, it's not the demoralization of America. I think this is the remoralization of America. We can't fix these problems until we actually look at them and do something about them. All right. So this brings us to the top five reasons that Yoel Roth is a piece of human excrement. All references available at LiderWithCredit.com. Number five. Okay. And we'll do this in ascending order with intensity. Roth, Yoel Roth, has a deeply rooted hatred for conservatives. Which, of course, is a problem if you're supposed to be in charge of trust. and say Trust. Trust. Let's say trust. Not to mention safety. I don't know if you know this. I've had a few safety scares myself. Right. <laughs> so head of Twitter trust and safety. Hate it. Let, me, let me give you the receipt. So on 2016, election day, this is what Roth tweeted. I'm just saying we fly over those states that voted for a racist tangerine for a reason. Oh, boy. Hey, any of your users live in those states? These people hate you. He was responding to critics of the, uh, the Women's March, for those who don't remember the pussy hat, a family-friendly yeah. affair. Mm -hmm. Tweeted this, yes, that person in the pink hat is clearly a bigger threat to your brand of feminism than actual Nazis in the White House. Huh. I think you meant to say actual Nazis at the Barclays Center. <laughs> so uh, here's another uh, issue, by the way. Uh, here he is discussing censoring a tweet. These are from the Twitter dumps. Uh, uh, Representative Matt Getz Roth, head of Twitter Trust and Safety, said, It doesn't quite fit anywhere, but I'm trying to talk safety into treating it as incitement. I think we'll get it over the line for removal as a conspiracy that incites violence. He colluded with American Intel to target conservatives who he didn't like. Here's an internal message. 
Roth uh, referred to as, quote, weekly sync. And what that refers to is he would have meetings with the FBI, uh, DHS, and the Director of National Intelligence. In another message, here's what Roth uh, actually wrote. He was complaining about how difficult it was to conceal <laughs> these meetings on his calendar. Talk about a persecution. Gosh, I'm meeting with the FBI and CIA. I'm meeting with them to try and ban conservatives. But is there a way like to put it in incognito mode? 2010, Yul Roth posted a link to a story titled, Can High School Students Ever Meaningfully Consent to Sex with Their Teachers? Spoiler alert, maybe. You can go read it. 2012, <laughs> Roth tweeted out, I enjoy having the kinds of meetings where Googling, quote, gay bareback porn is considered academic work. Gay! Ugh. 2015, Roth actually uh, wrote this regards, regarding the uh, future of porn at Twitter. Quote, Twitter will live to porn another day. Thing I just yell out loudly at work. Hilarious. Unbelievable. All right, so, so these, these are the tweets on his personal account. Do you know that he had a secret dirty account? Not kidding. Not making this up. He had a In dirtier. 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 Well, he called it his dirty account. For him, this is normal everyday language that right. he would he use had around a silly anybody, boy account. Children. Did he have a silly boy account? He had a silly boy account. It was called Otterific. <laughs> Otterific? At Otterific. Now, those are tweets. And you can say, ah, people drunk tweet all the time. Sure, you can tell by the typos. Here's his, his PhD thesis. was titled Gay Data. <laughs> and in it, he said that minors should be, he advocated for minors to be on gay dating websites. Oof. Here's some quotes. It's worth considering how, if at all, the current generation of popular sites of gay network sociability might fit into an overall queer social landscape that increasingly includes individuals under the ages of 18. Minors. Yeah. Read that as minors. Yeah. Oh. Individuals under the age I of 18. Saying, I, I get it, yo. Minors. I think individuals under the age of 18 sounds worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it sounds worse. Whatever focus he... group you ran sucks. Who'd you hire? Frank Luntz and his stupid sneakers and toupee? Also, I love the way that he tries to sound smart by the words he chose, yes. but he just sounds like a bigger fucking idiot. Pardon my language. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> my God. And he forgets to put a plural on the word things. Yeah. Thing. Hmm. Mm, sorry. <laughs> uh, HIV brain. So, a plus. Uh. Rather than merely trying to absolve themselves of legal responsibility or worse, trying to drive out teenagers entirely, uh. which we know means teenagers under 18, Service providers should instead focus on crafting safety strategies that can accommodate a wide variety of use cases for platforms like Grindr, including possibly their role in safely connecting queer young adults. So we're going to get into that story tonight. Also, the House of Representatives came out with this document stating the COVID maybe didn't come from the wet market and came from a lab. Maybe they want to blame it on China. We'll see. We're back now with a declassified House report that is shedding new light on how much U.S. intelligence agents knew about the COVID pandemic before it reached the U.S. And while documents show international spies alerted the U.S. about COVID just weeks after the Wuhan outbreak, they failed to quickly gather information from China, and that delayed any possible response from lawmakers. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney joined us now with a close Look, Ken, good morning. So first of all, why did these spies struggle to get information about the COVID pandemic? And then how did that impact policies the White House put into place really during the height of it? Good morning, Joe. Well, this report really has three main conclusions. One, it does say that the spy agencies did, using public sources, they did call it early on that this novel coronavirus emerging from China was going to become a global pandemic. And they warned the White House about that. And Donald Trump clearly misled the public about what he was hearing at the time. But then what the report says is the intelligence community failed to pivot and was unable to start spying on Chinese officials and ferreting out what, what White House officials needed to know in the early days about human-to-human -human transmission and about what the Chinese weren't saying. They weren't intercepting Chinese communications. They weren't coming up with the kind of information we expect the intelligence community to get, stealing secrets, in order to help inform policymakers. And so that meant that the response in the United States was delayed. I mean, there are other reasons for the delays. Donald Trump clearly didn't want to come to grips with this pandemic, but they, they didn't put in the social distancing, the mask wearing as early as they might have had they been armed with that information. And the report also says that the intelligence community is still not ready for the next pandemic. Joe. I want to ask you more about the Trump response. I mean, these spy agencies warned the Trump White House of a looming COVID threat well before the World Health Organization even declared the virus a global pandemic. But as you mentioned, then President Trump really downplayed the seriousness of COVID. Does this report say anything about his role in this? Yeah, absolutely. So we know from the Bob Woodward's reporting 
you know, he had those tape recorded interviews with Donald Trump that Trump acknowledged that he downplayed the seriousness of the virus. What this report shows is that it wasn't just the CDC and his health advisors that were telling him. It was the intelligence community. They were briefing the White House and Donald Trump and saying as, as early as January 2020 and well into February, they were issuing dire warnings about the potential for COVID-19 to become a global pandemic and kill Americans. And Donald Trump was telling the world that there was nothing to worry about. And on January 30th, he said, oh, there's only five cases here in the United States and, and we're going to take care of this thing. And then later, when he was asked about his intelligence warnings, he said that intelligence officials were speaking about the virus in a very ma matter of fact manner. This report, which looked deeply into the intelligence response, completely blows that out of the water, Joe. This report also points out that spy agencies just may not be equipped to handle future pandemics. Why is that? Um, the report identifies a cultural problem within some of these agencies that they just don't see bio threats as a top tier national security threat, even though this pandemic killed a million Americans. And Adam Schiff, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, pointed out to me that if a terrorist attack killed a million Americans, you know, this I would transform national culture. But these spy agencies still don't aren't geared up for the next pandemic to sort of train their esoteric spying capabilities, including communications intercepts and satellites onto the kind of health information that policymakers need. It's an ongoing struggle. The Biden administration is trying to turn the aircraft carrier, but there is cultural resistance, Joe. But also some of the biggest news this week was something that we already knew, but now is openly admitted and is basically a fact in our nation. And that is that the Central Intelligence Agency was uh, responsible for the death of Jen F. Kennedy. So CIA killed JFK. But millions of Americans felt like there was more to the story. Theories were running wild. Were the Russians involved, the CIA, LBJ? The government has been trying to keep a lid on sensitive documents for almost 60 years. But today, the National Archives finally released 13,000 classified documents on the assassination. The big bombshell buried in all of this is that the Soviets took credit for Oswald. The KGB said Oswald was a Soviet agent. They used his Russian wife to honey trap him. Oswald was actually living in the Soviet Union in the 50s where the KGB claims he was being trained. Is this Russian propaganda? Or did the Soviets really orchestrate the assassination of our president? Whether it's true or not, the CIA doesn't look great in this document dump. In these documents, the CIA said they had eyes and ears all over the Russian embassy in Mexico City. But when Oswald visited the Soviet embassy there to meet with an assassination specialist, the CIA didn't pounce, even though they had a running file on Oswald since the late 1950s. Plus, these documents allege Oswald was getting visas directly from Soviet embassies. So we're being left with more questions than answers from this document dump. And the archivists are still blocking 4,000 documents. We didn't really get answers to if Oswald was the lone shooter, the theory that experts all allege was a lie. We'll see what's behind those records and learn a little bit more about who created the CIA, maybe. Like, how did they come into existence and have the power to successfully take out a president in 1963? But before we can do any of that, we got to go this week's uh, kickoff with Luke Radowski from the best political shirts dot com. Let's get his Sunday report on world events in his lens. Let your games begin. Hey, you're in the arena. Let's go. Why we're here, how we got here, what the heck is going on? Elon. Thank you so much for joining us. The company has been so eager to hear from you live and direct. Our role is not to be bound by the First Amendment, but to serve a healthy public conversation. Hello, First Amendment. Freedom of speech is extremely important to the future of civilization. Focus less on thinking about free speech. <laughs> I mean, it is free speech, and uh, I, I think that's a fair characterization of what the mainstream media thinks is going on right now.
What makes the Grand Theft World podcast unique, invigorating, exciting, and informative? Most other podcasts out there are either doing straight up interviews or they're just covering the daily news. They're covering current events from the day they happen. And that is effective, it's useful, it's a great starting point. And then sometimes these current events change during the week past the first story. So we like to give it a little time. You have to wait till some of the dust settles on these stories in order to give them accurate coverage. And the other thing that's really missing in the media landscape is covering the articles that are coming out every day. That's great. That's necessary. But who's bringing in contextual history so that you can understand what has been going on for decades and decades to lead up to the machinations and actions that we see unfolding today. So what we do here on the podcast is we cover current events. Many of these things are censored, but we wait about a week. As a forensic historian, I focused mainly through my career on the history of globalism and collectivism and things that they call maybe the new world order. There's a lot of facts to these sort of circumstances, groups, events, activities, working groups that they've had over time. So for Grand Theft World listeners, we not only break down the current events, most of which that are censored during the week, we provide you with contextual history, we give you the source notes, the references, we do deep dives, and this really empowers you with an understanding of context and history so that you can make more informed decisions in your life. There's also a community, a membership where you guys can actually ask questions and we can get into the show and share evidence. And there's a town hall weekly for Grand Theft World for those who listen to it and are interested in covering the stories that we don't get to during a six hour show. Listening to it an hour a day, you could uh, easily consume the week's news, but you're gonna have substance and meaning and context and understanding. And with that, you can make higher quality decisions in your life. So if you're interested in more quality in your life, go to grandtheftworld.com, click podcast at the top, and we'll see you there. Thank you. These allegations are false. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game. What are the most surprising things that you discovered once you started pulling on that thread, who he was connected to, what institutions he was influential over, what events he participated in? Come on, man. What are you talking about? Come on, man. No. You don't have to think about it, dude. I got this quote because uh, you said you didn't know much about Klaus Schwab. I made it my job. To, as soon as this happened, I'm like, okay, this guy's their front man. Let me learn about the official history of the World Economic Forum. I got their 40 year history. I got every book that Klaus Schwab has written or ghost written. I went through those books. This is one of the most interesting passages. Come on, man. Come on.